All right. Good morning. Uh, my name is Bill Taylor. Uh, I'm the executive vice president here at the United States Institute of Peace. I'm very glad to have you all here. It's gonna, we've been looking forward to this conversation for, for some time here. Um, uh, Institute of Peace um, has uh, focuses on conflict. Um, we were established in 1984. Um, and focused on violent conflict around the world. We do a whole lot of work in Iraq and, and have an office there and in Afghanistan have an office there and Tunisia have an office there. Um, violent conflict has not been part of the European uh, situation environment until recently. Um, and so we haven't done a whole lot in this and, uh, and frankly, um, it's good that the, that the East Europe and uh, Europe and broadly has been peaceful. Well, it's not now. Um, and, and it hasn't been since um, uh, for the last three years. Um, and we have to go back to the Balkans time, to the 90s, um, uh, for, for lessons um, and information and ideas about how, how, this, uh, how this can work. So the Institute of Peace has been looking for those kinds of, uh, of connections. And today's discussion uh, uh, pulls those two together. Um, um, Ambassador Bardu is going to talk to you about uh, his book, his experience, um, his uh, understanding of how the Balkans worked out, but he's also got in mind the conflict today, uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Um, he has in mind the aggression of the Russians against Ukraine, uh, illegally occupying Crimea and stirring up and leading the, uh, the conflict, um, the war, um, in the eastern part of Ukraine. Um, so the focus first on the Balkans, but recognizing that where we're going with this is the current policy, is the current issue, is the current fight, is the current war. Um, so that is the, that's the theme here for today. And it's great to have this group here, not just, not just this group here, but folks in the audience. So we have ambassadors and we have German ambassadors and, uh, and others around here. It's great. We have people from across the street. Uh, John, welcome, and Oris to come out of retirement. Harris, this is all good. All good. This is a, a great thing, Chris. Good to have you here. Uh, so this is this is a, a great group. Uh, looking forward to this conversation and to lead this conversation. Um, my colleague uh, Charles North. Uh, Charles, um, we have borrowed from USAID, where he had, has had and continues to have a 30-year career at AID. Um, his qualifications go back, as I say, many years, but um, he was in Moscow um, for seven years. And the last three years of those seven, uh, he was the USAID mission director and has the honor of being kicked out of Moscow. Uh, uh, so that's, that's a great qualification, we think, for his work. Uh, so he's senior advisor here at USIP on uh, Ukraine and Russia, and I'm very pleased uh, to hand this over to Charles. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you all so much for being here today. I will apologize at the beginning for my voice. Uh, I assume it will hold out. Uh, if not, uh, I'll ask someone else to step in. But it is great to see you all here. Uh, as Bill said, we have two panels. We're starting first with one on the Balkans, and then we'll go to a group focusing even more so on Ukraine. Uh, we've asked both uh, panels to look at four kind of uh, uh, statements of uh, uh, in a framework of how we ought to be thinking about the issues. First, on leverage, what leverage was or is available uh, to bring parties to agreement? Ag what is the agreement? What were or should be the essential ingredients uh, of an effective agreement? And then on to implementation. What were or, or will be the challenges of implementing peace agreements? And finally, the issue of corruption. How important is that to the peace process? Is peace possible with high levels of corruption? So these are four of the themes we'll be looking at in both uh, panels. And so before we get started, let me just introduce the, our panel, uh, the first panel. Uh, and James Pardue uh, is first, he is uh, an author. Uh, he is the author of Peacemakers, uh, American Leadership and the End of Genocide in the Balkans. He was at the heart of U.S. national policymaking throughout the humanitarian crises in the Balkans, from Richard Holbrooke's negotiations on Bosnia in 1995 until the independence of Kosovo in 2008. He was the primary U.S. negotiator of the Ored Agreement in Macedonia, and he was ambassador to Bulgaria from 2002 to 2005. 
Jim is joined by Michael Haltzell, who has been the uh, a senior fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations of Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Advanced International Studies. He's been there since 2006. He came to Johns Hopkins University after a long career in public service, capped by his tenure from 1994 to 2005 as Democratic Staff Director of the Subcommittee on European Affairs of the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee and as Senior Foreign Policy Advisor to then uh, Senator Joe Biden. So with that, uh, let me turn it over to you, Jim, uh, for your thoughts on uh, the lessons from the Balkans and uh, where we should be thinking about going forward. Let's see. There we go. There, yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, uh, thank you, Charles. Mm -hmm. Uh, my presentation this morning is drawn from my book, which is shamelessly promoted on this uh, particular slide. Um, the wars that accompanied the breakup of Yugoslavia in the 1990s were the uh, deadliest conflicts in Europe since World War II and produced a level of genocide in Europe not seen since the Holocaust. An estimated 110,000 people lost their lives and over 3 million were, became refugees or homeless. After a re reluctant start, the U.S.-led international intervention in the Balkans that began in 1995 produced a major foreign policy success for the United States. It stopped a war in Bosnia that included genocide and cri crimes against humanity. It ended a humanitarian crisis in, the U in uh, Kosovo, and it prevented a civil war in Macedonia. Overall, it restored peace and stability to about 40 million people in the region. And working very closely with the European Contact Group, the Balkan engagement reestablished American leadership on a crit critical security issue in Europe. But, uh, Bosnia was also the high water mark of U.S. Russian relations in the early post Soviet period. The breakup of Yugoslavia also transformed several international organizations. NATO was converted from a Cold War organization focused on the Central Europe to a modern alliance capable of expanding its partnerships and operating outside the central region of Europe. The Balkan experience also changed the European Union. The EU established dur during this Balkan period a foreign policy identity by appointing a high representative for common security and, and uh, foreign uh, policy and an organization to support it. The EU engaged in developmental development uh, activities in Bosnia and Kosovo, deployed security forces to replace NATO in Bosnia, and along with the United States, negotiated the Oakwood Agreement that Charles mentioned. After uh, Dayton, the UN recovered from the disastrous UNPERFOR period in Bosnia. The UN governed Kosovo for eight years, and uh, the UN negotiations set the stage for Kosovo's independence in 2008. The UN's criminal, uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia indicted 161 people and convicted 80, uh, um, um, 80 of them for genocide and crimes against humanity. Now today, <clears throat> the Balkan region is at peace and seven new nations are generally oriented toward democracy, um, EU, and NATO membership. However, as we all know, they, there are serious issues remaining. <laughs> serious developmental problems, and the process, in fact, may take generations to complete. I can't see my slide, but I hope it's right. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can, right here. Um, the three distinct crises um, in the breakup of Yugoslavia provide examples that may be useful to a discussion of the Ukraine. There are obviously strate great strategic differences between the Balkans and the Ukraine. Russia is not Serbia, the Ukraine is not Bosnia. But there are some similarities that I'd like to mention. First of all, Moscow's fantasy that Russian troops are not involved in the conflict is a kind of a less credible version of what of the fantasy that Milosevic spun in denying that Belgrade's had no provided no military support to the Bosnian Serbs. The acceptance of unarmed OSCE observers in the Donbass uh, looks a lot, to me a lot like the Kosovo verification mission. 
the proposal to consider weak UN peacekeeping structure focuses diplomatic attention away from the real issues and looks like a clone in the Ukraine of a disastrous unperfor in Bosnia. We should also be wary of the Republika Srpska model in Bosnia. Now, again, uh, Donbas is not, Eastern Ukraine is not uh, the Republika Srpska. There are many differences. But because the leaders that are driving Ukraine policy today are, are, are very experienced veterans of the Bosnian negotiations and in dealing with the United States through the contact group. I expect that ultimately Moscow will seek to create some form of pro-Russian political entity in, the, in, the, in eastern Ukraine as a poison pill uh, with the uh, goal of paralyzing any, the Ukrainian government on any decisions that Moscow does not like. Now for some comments on uh, leverage and agreement. All peace agreements are the products of leverage and will. And, the, um, and in Bosnia, Holbrook had a lot of leverage. Economic sanctions are slow, but they worked. And Milosevic in 1995 was fairly desperate that he um, get some kind of economic sanctions relief. Naming corrupt cronies and denying them travel was also a significant influence on Belgrade. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate the power of this kind of pressure on uh, leaders in, in, uh, in Russia. NATO airstrikes on Serbian heavy weapons, Croat Muslim offensive in Western ba Balkans also put serious military pressure on Belgrade. The Croatian leaders saw the, uh, a path in, in their uh, negotiations to solving the issue of Eastern Slavonia and to currying favor with the uh, United States and the EU for the future. The Muslims simply wanted the killing to stop and to get national recognition for their government in some form. But the U.S. also used, um, agreed to train and equip the Bosnian Federation military to assist in their future security, to motivate them to sign the Dayton Agreement. In Macedonia, non-military leverage on the parties was significant. The, Al the Albanians wanted more recognition of their heritage and, a great, and greater influence in a local and national governmental institutions. The ethnic Macedonians wanted to retain the unity of their nation. They also knew that EU and NATO would not uh, accept another episode of ethnic repression in the Balkans. And their future relationship with the EU and the United States was also at stake in these negotiations. In Kosovo, aggressive high-level diplomacy failed. I met with Milosevic in December 1998 and again in January 1999. He would not face the historical and political penalties of losing Kosovo, and he had no will to reach a diplomatic settlement. So I became convinced that he was resigned to war with NATO, and only a 78-day air campaign expelled Serbian forces uh, from Kosovo. I see a parallel between the Milosevic attitude on Kosovo and Putin's commitment to the Ukraine. Like Serbian nationalism, Russia's historic relationship with Ukraine is deep, and Putin plays nationalism for his own personal political advantage. Agreeing to a settlement that might allow the Ukraine to align itself with the West would be extremely difficult for Putin or any nationalist Russian leader. In the Ukraine, the, the employment of NATO and EU military forces that were so important in the Balkans uh, are obviously too pro provocative and not feasible. But supplying lethal defensive weapons to Kiev uh, makes an important statement. And some form of Western military training uh, for the Ukraine forces might be another uh, level of assistance uh, to consider. In my experience, it was rare for an agreement to bubble up from the parties of the, of the negotiations. Instead, activist diplomacy explored the issues with the parties, then pushed the process with very specific proposals and potential agreements. Successful agreements are rarely statements of principle, even though uh, political leaders often prefer to accept uh, general principles without details.
Real agreements need specific laws, actions, and detailed commitments and timelines to be valid. The rest of my uh, personal lessons relates to corruption. For the military assistance program that I ran in Bosnia, we operated under very extensive rules to ensure that donor funding was managed in a way that would avoid corruption. It was tough, it was arduous, and it was sometimes cumbersome. But I'm now convinced that such practices could apply, should apply to every foreign assistance effort. We know from painful experiences in Vietnam, in Iraq, and Afghanistan that corruption makes a mockery of the rule of law and of democratic values in general. My impression, although I'm certainly no expert, is that corruption is rampant in the Ukraine and they are doing little to restrict it. International assistance to the Ukraine should take every measure to ensure that our, that at least for our programs, the resources will be, will not be squandered or stolen by corrupt officials. This is possible if the right practices are put in place and they are enforced. The period of American leadership in the Balkans was a high point of U.S. global leadership in the post-Soviet period. American leadership in the Balkans was based on democratic and humanitarian values and U.S. interest. It fo focused on close cooperation with strong European allies and international institutions. Diplomacy led the way, but appropriate military force was used when required. For most of the period, the breakup of Yugoslavia was at the top of the American foreign policy agenda and had the full attention of the White House and the Secretary of State. As we discuss the Balkan experience, we have to consider the status of American influence in the world today, the overall capabilities of our diplomatic corps, and the priority of Ukraine in U.S. national policy. I want to emphasize that the U.S. that the American policy that prevailed in the former Yugoslavia was the polar opposite of the of the uh, Trump foreign and national security policy that we see today. This morning, I join other foreign policy and national security professionals who are sounding the alarm about the decline of U.S. influence abroad. As a former U.S. Special Envoy, I am particularly concerned about the current administration's contempt uh, for democracy and the extreme cuts in the diplomatic uh, capability of the State Department and the U.S. Foreign Service. And I say this as someone who is not a Foreign Service officer, but as someone with a military background who worked with them closely for over a decade. This is a very tough international environment for any U.S. diplomat representing the U.S. Uh, uh, abroad today. And I think it is particularly difficult as we consider effective policy toward issues as important as the Russian aggression in the Ukraine. Thank you very much for your attention. So let me now turn it over to, to Mike uh, for your observations. Thank you, Charles. Before I go into the book, I'd just like to congratulate Jim Pardue and, and recognize the tremendous contributions that he's made to the United States and to, and to peace. I think this is especially important at a time when the current occupant of the White House clearly undervalues American diplomats. Expertise matters, and so does character, and Jim has both. His book, Peacekeepers, is important. It's analytical, it's penetrating, it has a fluid, down-to-earth style with a wealth of first-hand detail. I found it riveting, and I suspect such a well-informed audience as this one would also. No, I don't get 10 percent of the cut. <laughs> I must also say that Jim is, is the exceedingly rare autobiographer, although it's not strictly speaking an autobiography, who minimizes his own role and also freely admits his mistakes, although there weren't many and they were tangential. Let me just go right into the leverage question, which I think is central. Obviously, military leverage is key. We used it in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in Kosovo, and the train and equip program that Jim headed is also part of this. Legal is what I would say is the second lever, and Jim alluded to this, charging or even just threatening to charge individuals with war crimes and sanctions on individuals. They work. Not always, but they can be made to work. Third, economic assistance, Charles will like me my saying this, or denial thereof clearly plays a role 
Fourth, and this is something that Jim points out in his book and is often uh, overlooked, is the question of prestige. Some of these foreign leaders have healthy egos, and a meeting with the President of the United States is a, is a real um, a carrot to dangle out there. This was certainly done um, with regard to Milosevic, who desperately wanted to have a meeting with President Clinton. And finally, long-range prospects for membership in Euro-Atlantic institutions, the EU and NATO, is also important. Uh, Jim and his colleagues, especially his boss, Dick Holbrook, utilize these levers to maximum advantage, and the details are in the book. I won't repeat them. But I think there are important differences today which will make the task of American diplomatic peacemakers more difficult. First of all, with regard to the military option, U.S. combat forces, as we all know, are engaged militarily in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Africa, and U.S. public opinion is clearly against more such involvements. Secondly, we have an erratic, unpredictable president without a knowledge base on foreign affairs. President Trump's lukewarm endorsement of NATO and his outspoken pro-Russian sympathies as demonstrated just last week by his refusal to implement CATSA, that's an acronym for Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act. While Moscow is increasing its influence in the Western Balkans, all this erodes trust in the United States. Moreover, President Trump publicly undercuts his own Secretary of State on a regular basis. Inevitably, all this diminishes the credibility of U.S. negotiators. Jim used the term just now, the question of will, and I think this is exactly what we're talking about, or lack thereof. There's also much less bipartisan consensus on foreign policy in Congress. I'll be glad to talk about that in Q&A if you'd like. The Office of the Special Envoy in general has fallen out of favor. Thank heavens there's an exception with Kurt Volker in Ukraine. I regret to say that the international reputa reputation of the United States has been severely harmed by the Iraq War, especially by Abu Ghraib, and subsequently by President Trump's actions, withdrawal from the Paris Climate Change Accord, and in general, his America First policy. There are now alternative sources for economic assistance. It's not just the U.S. anymore, China, Russia, Turkey. And more broadly, to use an old Soviet term, the correlation of forces has shifted away from the United States. This may be self-inflicted. I think it largely is, but it's a reality that our negotiators have to face. Several Balkan countries are now members of EU and or NATO. That's the good news. But the, the bad news is, once you're in, leverage doesn't work so much anymore. All you have to do is look at the difficulties the EU is having disciplining Poland and Hungary. NATO has frozen out members out of the, out of the military committee, the Greek 67 to 74, and actually Portugal in the summer of 75. This may, become, uh, this may be tested uh, with regard to Turkey and, and, and the Kurds. I hope not. And then finally, there's the broader question of technology, uh, the internet, social media, right-wing populists, once local, and that was the case except for radio and TV broadcasts in the Balkans. Now they've gone international, and of course, there are the disinformation campaigns by Russia. So is there still room for action? I've painted up all the, all the differences. Well, what could be done? Uh, one concrete example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in order to preempt secession by the Republic of Srpska, why not station several hundred EU peacekeepers from U4 in Birchko? thereby effectively splitting the RS. The EU does many wonderful things, but it's uncomfortable with machtpolitik, which sometimes is necessary. Jim's book is about American diplomacy, so its focus is properly on the State Department and ad hoc creations like the contact group. Congress, you won't be surprised to hear me say, also played an important, if secondary, and often backstage role in much of what transpired. By far the most important congressional players in the Bosnian uh, crisis were my old boss, Joe Biden, and former Senator Bob Dole. Um, Joe Lieberman and John McCain also played important roles. Washington, you, you just can't look at a, at a, uh, a sheet of, of office holders in Washington and get the whole story. 
personalities matter, too. And aside from Biden, who did have and does have a knowledge base and passion for American engagement in the Balkans, he had one unique advantage. Of all the 100 senators and 435 representatives, Biden had the closest personal um, relationship with President Bill Clinton. He spoke with him at least two or three times a week and often more frequently. He could therefore exert leverage, ultimately on the warring parties through the president who determined U.S. policy. And I can tell you Dick Holbrook took note and cultivated Biden, especially <coughs> in the run-up to the Kosovo War. I mean, I remember <laughs> I remember getting a phone call out of the blue in October 1998 from Holbrook on his cell phone, who had just emerged from the meeting with uh, Milosevic. Why he didn't just want to tell Mike Halsall, he wanted to tell Joe Biden what was going on. There was an amazing amount of backstage coordination. Um, in November 1994, the um, FY95 Defense Authorization Act eliminated further funding for something called Operation Sharp Guard, in which the U.S. Sixth Fleet helped enforce the U.N.-mandated arms embargo on Bosnia in the Adriatic because, in practice, the arms embargo, well-intentioned though it was, uh, only pre uh, prevented weapons from only going to the Bosniaks. The Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Croats were supplied overland. And again, I remember a conference near Bonn uh, when the International Press Corps totally misunderstood this and the uh, chairman of the, uh, of the Bundeswehr, the, uh, uh, General Klaus Naumann, came in and read the riot act to them. This was important also because we looked the other way, as some of you may know, when Iran supplied the Bosniaks with light arms um, through Croatia, si simply looked the other way. Um, Biden constantly urged that Clinton threaten the use of American ground forces, especially if European peacekeeping forces had to be withdrawn from Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, he also dis and and the president took note of this. And if you look at his first Air Force Academy speech in May of '95, he said that specifically. Then came Srebrenica and the second Sarajevo um, market massacre. There was strong pressure from the Congress to intervene, and we know what happened. Uh, jumping ahead, by the time of the conflict in Kosovo, Dole had retired from the Senate. If anything, Biden played an even more important role in Kosovo, uh, meeting, often meeting at the White House with, uh, with Clinton, and I'll talk about that if you'd like in the Q&A. In fact, we contributed talking points to Again, it was an Air Force Academy uh, commencement speech, just by the luck of the draw, um, that President Clinton gave. Uh, if I remember correctly, we put talking points specifically threatening uh, a land invasion. Uh, the president chose to tone it down a bit, but he did uh, talk about increasing U.S. peacekeeping forces after the war was over from 4,000 to 7,000. He did use very strong language against Milosevic. Um, Jim in his book says, and I quote, in the end, neither a NATO land invasion nor the use of attack helicopters was necessary. That's true, but I would submit that we came a lot closer than a lot of people think. Not only Biden, General Wes Clark, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, uh, British Defense Minister who later became NATO Secretary General George Robertson, were all pushing hard for the land option. And it wasn't even clear where from, from Albania, Bosnia, Hungary, or Bulgaria. In Albania, the uh, Tirana Kukish road was strengthened specifically to accommodate armored personnel carriers, a fact that was undoubtedly known to Serbian intelligence. At the end of the day, no one, at least outside of Serbia, really knows exactly what persuaded Milosevic to capitulate, but I do think the threat of, 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 of a ground invasion was certainly part of it. Another example of congressional action involves sending Milosevic to ICTI, the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, at The Hague. Uh, in Jim's book, he states, Bill Montgomery convinced Jinjic to send Milosevic to The Hague in June of 2001. Well, I'm sure that Ambassador Montgomery played a role, but I have to say I think more fundamentally important was the congressional threat to reimpose U.S. economic sanctions on Serbia, which had been withdrawn after Kostunica took over as president. What's the proof of this? Well, Serbian Prime Minister Zoran Đinđić came to Washington twice within six weeks that spring to try to talk us out of it. When we weren't talked out of it, very soon thereafter, Milosevic was delivered to The Hague. Incidentally, as sidelight, I think the assassination of Zoran Đinđić in March of 2003 
was the single most harmful act in the last 20 years in the Balkans in terms of what might have been. Um, one other thing which has direct relevance today, and I have to bring this up, Jim says in the book, quote, the sizable Albanian population in the pressure of a valley in southern Serbia had the capacity to cause considerable parallel trouble in Serbia if any partition proposal became serious in Kosovo. Well, that's true, but it goes even further. There's no mention of a possible land swap of Presheva, Medvedia, and Bujanovac in Serbia for the four Serbian majority municipalities in Kosovo north of the Ibar River. And this is actually what the borders were prior to 1957. I'm told that this idea is still being seriously discussed with Serbian recognition <coughs> of Kosovo's independence as an important part of the package. I think it would be a terrible idea. We can talk about that in the Q&A also, if you want. Also, uh, there's mention of the violence in Mitrovica in March 2004, and it's absolutely true. Actually, it became, on St. Patrick's Day, a province-wide anti-Serb pogrom in Kosovo. U.S. troops, 11 busloads of them, came up from Camp Bonsteel about 10 minutes before the, the, the goon squad arrived at the Serbian uh, center of Gracinica and basically saved the day. I have to tell one quick anecdote because I think it's instructive of, of how backstage stuff can work. When Biden was in uh, Kosovo in the winter, I guess it was 2000, 2001, he, we met with all of the leaders and one of them was uh, Ramush Haradinaj, who's now the prime minister. He comes from western Kosovo, tough guy, was a guerrilla leader, somebody you could talk to. We got back to Washington, Biden wrote a letter to Haradinaj. Uh, we had also visited the uh, uh, Visaki uh, Dechani Serbian Orthodox Monastery, early 14th century jewel UN World Heritage Site. Biden wrote him a letter saying, look, I know this is, this is your territory. Uh, I'm counting on you to be sure that it's protected because there had been crazies who had tried to climb over the walls and whatever. Um, when the pogrom came on St. Patrick's Day three, day, three years later, there were churches, cathedrals burned down all over Kosovo. Uh, Visaki Dachani wasn't touched. And I went to Kosovo a few months later, and Haradina greeted me with the simple words, I hope Senator Biden was taking notice of what happened. Um, now, quickly, what should be essential ingredients of an effective uh, uh, ingredients to an effective agreement. First of all, the big thing, realization that no better alternative is available. And Jim sketches out how uh, Aliyah Izetbegovic, uh, the head of the Bosniaks, under, finally was made to understand this at Dayton. Secondly, the realization that the potential consequences of not reaching an agreement are dire. Well, you know, again, I'm talking more about Dayton. The war would have resumed, and I think it's pretty clear that uh, Prijed or in other places would have fallen. Uh, and third, and this is commonsensical, that no party be completely satisfied or completely dissatisfied. In other words, that there not be a diktat, that everybody is only partially satisfied. What are the challenges of implementing peace agreements? As Jim points out, there's little appetite today for American leadership except in counter-terrorist operations, so it's likely that we'll need to rely on UN blue helmets, and our president is not exactly a fan of the UN or any multilateral operations. Um, we should certainly, in any blue, blue, blue helmet operation, insist on a sensible chain of command, sufficiently liberal rules of engagement to avoid, to avoid a repeat of hostage taking of peacekeepers, which was the story from 1992 to 1994 in Bosnia. For the longer term, in order to go beyond peace implementation to genuine reconciliation, the key, it seems to me, is education. And everybody knows the various nationalities in the Western Balkans are famous for weaponizing history. I would urge you to read another book edited by a Purdue professor, Charlie Ingreo, and, and Thomas Emmert, called Confronting the Yugoslav Controversies, a Scholar's Initiative. Really worthwhile. It's a multi-authored book by the very authors from the various nationalities of the um, of the Balkans. Ideally, a joint history curriculum for elementary and secondary schools should be developed and implemented and not have the segregation of, of students as is going on in places like Mostar. The Croats go to school in the morning, the Bosniaks in the afternoon. Uh, 
And more broadly, we have to involve civil society as much as possible in implementation. Finally, corruption. It's a cancer on democracy and a severe impediment to peace implementation and reconciliation. I agree completely with all of Jim's prescriptions. Put anti-corruption measures at the top of our assistance programs, demand transparency, install competitive processes in procurement, increase financial controls and oversight, and, and hold foreign officials accountable. He implemented all these in the train and equip program, and that's why it was such a success. However, like it or not, the fact is that many of the most prominent leaders in the Boy Scouts, uh, in the Balkans, are not Boy Scouts. Uh, all you have to do is go to Sarajevo or Pristina and go with natives, and they'll tell you that incredible palace on the hill belongs to, I'll let you fill in the names. And they're not even shy about it. Unfortunately, although it's distasteful in order to secure and implement peace, we have needed to and on occasion will probably continue to need to cooperate with these folks. And of course, nothing would go further toward re reducing corruption than broadly based lawful economic development. Related to corruption is the issue of war crimes. The U.S. Should have, at, should have absolutely nothing to do with convicted war criminals. But we also must respect the decisions of the courts. If somebody's indicted and then exonerated and he or she is in a position of authority, of course we should deal with him or her. And of course, Haradina is example A. He has been twice indicted and twice exonerated by international courts. And finally, very last word, we should realize the simple fact that people can change. Should never forget that Zoran Djindjic began his career as an ultranationalist, but he evolved into what I consider to have been a Democrat. I have other comments about some of the wonderful characters that Jim describes in the book, whom I had episodic contact with, but I'll save that for over cocktails or Q&A if you'd like. Thank you. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, this has so far been a very rich uh, discussion on a lot of uh, perspectives. Before we go to questions uh, from the audience, I want to give Jim the opportunity to uh, pose a question or make a, a response uh, comment uh, to what Mike has, has said. Um, I just want to say something about corruption. <clears throat> I, I, I think we have to be very careful. I, I, I disagree with my friend here a little bit on this. I think we have to be very careful about talking ourselves into accepting corruption because our clients are thugs. Uh, I, I, just, I just have come to the position that I, I reject that. It doesn't work. It didn't work in Vietnam, it didn't work in Iraq, and it doesn't, doesn't work in Afghanistan. And they are the demandeur, not the, they're not in charge. They need our resources. And I think that we ought to, to demand uh, high levels of, of uh, control of resources that we provide. If we don't, it absolutely undermines everything we do in terms of convincing people that democracy is a good thing because what they see is the big house on the hill. That's right. And so, yes, I, I, I know, but I, I also don't believe in the conversion of thugs. I've worked with a lot of thugs, and I don't believe in conversion. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think you, I sat down with the guy, when we started training quit program, the Minister of Defense of the Bosniak side sat in front of me and said, I need $4 million to start this program. I said, Minister, you need to have one thing, you need to understand one thing and one thing very clearly. You, not one nickel of this money will ever go through your hands, not one nickel. You tell us what needs to be bought. Elected to a national office in elections that are judged free and fair. Do we then just simply say, well, you know, you were a crook 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago. You now happen to be in a national office. We're going to cut off relations with you? I don't think we can do that. No, no you can't. No, obviously you can't. But you can build programs that, that where the money doesn't go through their hands. Oh, that's for the future. I agree completely. Yeah. <coughs> sure. All right. Well, open it up to the audience. Uh, let's hear your questions. Uh, Please, right here. Yes, please. I'm Tom Bradley from George Mason University. I'd like to ask you, uh, given that idea of not letting money pass through the hands of thugs, how can you uh, train and educate, uh, equip, uh, provide military and 
sure the government is corrupt and a plutocracy from the top down. How can you how can you separate uh, actors within the government so that you can actually provide military equipment, training, intelligence, um, all those things uh, to a government that is corrupt from the top down? That's the next panel. I, yeah, I, I I mean my quick an, my quick answer to that is don't give them the money, handle the money yourself. I I, I really uh, we we didn't. By the way, in, in, the, in Bosnia, we didn't give any money for, for uh, soldiers. We didn't pay salaries. Uh, we said, look, your country, your army, you, we'll train you, we'll equip you, but we're not paying them because a lot of this leakage is, is through salaries, and I, I think we need to look, take a hard look at that. I think you can do most of it through procedures, and, and you just have to be tough about it. I mean, fr fr frankly, anti-corruption is, is not the high part of our policy agenda in many of these places, and probably the Ukraine. We we talk ourselves out of accepting it, but I just think in the long run, if we if we just let these, we don't pay attention to these procedures, we pay a price for it in uh, things like uh, Karzai, whose whose relationships around the country, he could he had no influence outside his palace. Why? Because the police and everybody in the government was was stealing money all over the place, and the people knew it. So I, I just think we got we've got to make this a priority. Sorry. Okay. Here, got a microphone up front on the. Uh, Mitchell one. Koloski with yeah. UMD. Uh, good to see you all. Um, and we're actually going to host an event with Ambassador Purdue on the Macedonia front, uh, probably in February or early March. Um, my discussion, my question deals with implementation. Uh, first thing is in terms of. Uh, there's still fear in Macedonia of these uh, potential greater Albania. Uh, and so what are the assurances of the Old Crete Agreement or these types of agreements on uh, territorial uh, integrity, uh, the sovereignty of these nations? And then the other goes to influences of other uh, uh, countries, for example, Albania back in December of 2016 brought the leaders of the Albanian minority um, uh, in Macedonia and brought them to Tirana and they worked on a type of a Tirana platform that called on uh, Macedonia to change its flag, to be accommodating more to the Albanian minority, its anthem, implement language laws that would apply to the entire country and not so much in the, only the areas, the Albanian minority. And so, and then some of these thugs that you're mentioning, can you probably elaborate in Macedonia and seeing if uh, some of them, uh, the characters today, so. Um, yeah, um, first of all, I, in, in dealing with the um, Albanian leaders in Macedonia, I never, I never uh, found them interested in breaking away from Macedonia and, and, and aligning themselves with either Kosovo or Albanians. Mm -hmm. They had political power inside of Macedonia. What they wanted was more influence in the structures. So I never saw, I never encountered any of them eager to run off and join up with. In fact, I, I, I had conversations with a lot of them who said, that, you know, they. They, they, they were offended by some of these guy outsiders, these Al Albanians coming in and trying to influence them. I think uh, it was a huge mistake for uh, Albania to get involved, the, the nation of Albania to get involved uh, and, and, and uh, as you described uh, a year or so ago. And uh, I, I, but it was way too sensitive. They shouldn't have done it. Um, I, I think the U.S. frankly should have tried to influence them uh, uh, not to not to do that, and so I, I just I don't think there's a real question of unity of Macedonia. I think it's a matter of working out the the political arrangements um, for the future. I mean, the big question there is the name issue, and we have the most hopeful period right now that uh, ever, and and hopefully Nimitz can solve that in the next few weeks. Mike, I'm going to just say a word, uh, Meadow. You're you're right, and I think that. Um, Trend lines are not good because for a long time, the Albanian government in Tirana was a good neighbor in the Balkans and was refraining from intervening in any way with the uh, Albanian minorities in other countries. And it's continued, uh, including uh, of, in all places, uh, Montenegro, the, the one country in the Western Balkans which has been notably successful in integrating its Albanian and Slavic Muslim minority. 
and over an issue about a, a, a town, sort of a suburb of Pudgorica called Tuzi, uh, the same sort of behavior. And I think it's very unfortunate, but it's a relatively new development, and it's not, and it ha to my, I, I don't follow it on a 24-7 basis, but I don't think it's stopped. Other questions? Yeah, Doug. Doug Wake, former Foreign Service officer and OSCE official, including spending some time in Serbian Montenegro OSCE mission. Uh, first, from that capacity, I have to say uh, a word of thanks to Ambassador Perdue for the words you said about the Foreign Service and the role of international organizations as someone who come from a different background and recognizes that uh, these uh, institutions are, are under some threat now. I'd like to ask you to think a little bit about or give us a couple of comments on the link between the Balkans and possible action in Ukraine, because I think uh, Mike and others discussed some of the differences very well. Um, and one of the differences that nobody's quite explicitly highlighted um, is that you have, as a party to the conflict in Ukraine, a permanent member of the Security Council, a country which, uh, although it was alluded to um, when you're talking about military options um, are never going to involve the kind of uh, steps that we took against Serbia, uh, particularly in the Kosovo conflict. So uh, what I'm wondering before it moves from your panel to the next is if you can try to identify some of the elements that are really common from your experience in uh, the pressure that was exerted to get a solution uh, to the various conflicts in the Balkans. Um, that might actually uh, give us some, some hope for an American role in, in this uh, current conflict? Well, in the, in the Bosnian um, period, uh, Russia was very eager to work closely with the West, and that, that was easy. In 99, when Putin came to power, everything changed. Uh, now, um, we, the, the Russians stayed in the contact group, which I think is important because the contact group was the way that we, we talked to them about, even though we didn't agree, uh, we could talk to them. And uh, they at least would, Moscow would at least know where we were coming from and would, would, and they never broke with the contact group, at least through 2008. I don't know where it stands now. Maybe there is no contact group. Um, the, I, I, I'm, you know, there's a lot of shallow hostility about international organizations today. Organiza uh, international organizations are, uh, can be, as all of you know who've worked with them, uh, can be difficult and, and troubling to, to and the, but they're not our subordinates, you know, and we, we have to work with it. And the payoff is huge. By getting international organizations involved in American foreign policy, A, they can reduce the cost if they participate, uh, but, but perhaps more importantly, it's a way for the United States to, uh, to, to exert its influence. We may not win the debate, but the fact that we debate it, that we take it there, that we're serious about it, that we put our proposals on the table and we speak to the, to the world through the United Nations and these other organizations is important. Um, the Russians can veto it, and they, the Russians never agreed to the Adesari proposal for independence in Kosovo, but the, the, the independence happened. And what, what made it happen more easily is because we had gone through two or three years of extensive diplomacy, painful diplomacy, um, it, with the United Nations that Adesari had done his job and the Russians were involved in it from start to finish. And at the end, um, a Russian diplomat, I was in Moscow one time, the Russian diplomat looked up at me and says, Jim, we can't stop you from getting, getting uh, Kosovo, independence for Kosovo, but you're gonna pay a price for that. And the price for that's Georgia. And as it turned out, you know, I reported that, but as it turned out, that's true. Um, so just engaging them and the use of international organizations is extremely powerful. And there's a lot of shallow stuff now about the UN and others. It's crazy. We're bigger than that. Last question back here. Now, um, you made a mention of involving civil society more in implementation of <coughs> peace agreements. But by then, the terms are baked in, and civil society may go along because they're getting funding from the elements who are involved in negotiations. 
but the general populace may or may not be supportive. What about involving civil society more in the negotiations themselves? Uh, I think that'd be very hard. Any, any, uh, any negotiation that you do, I mean, just Holbrook working with the contact group was tough because the more parties you have talking to the parties of a conflict, the more complicated and difficult it gets. And so I, I, I think there's a limit to how big the negotiating table is. Now, civil society is very important. In some of these places, there was no civil, real civil society, um, and we had to work on it. One of the one th points I make in the book is the level of, uh, of absorption. We tend to run in uh, real fast when we get some kind of deal and really kind of flood the place with resources, and uh, frequently they're not really capable of, of absorbing it all. Uh, Afghanistan, schools with no teachers, hospitals with no doctors, uh, roads going nowhere. I mean, there was a, just a lot of, of assistance programs that went in, and um, I, I think I don't, I don't I don't have a real good answer for that, but um, but I do think we need to look at the absorption possibility. It's never going to be as fast as the United States wants it to be. Never. We 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 are very anxious to get something settled and done and moved on, and there we go. Uh, Afghanistan is a Hundred-year project, uh, Bosnia generations. You know, so it's going to take a while. Mike? Yeah, real quick on that. Um, I agree with Jim. Obviously, getting the civil society people involved in the nitty-gritty of the negotiation is, I, I think, pretty much impossible. But as Doug Waite will attest, and other people in this room, Orest and a few others. Uh, one area where the uh, where civil society at least has pretty close to equal right of speaking up is uh, the OSCE and especially at the at the Human Dimension Implementation Meeting, the annual two-week meeting in Warsaw. I was honored to lead a U.S. delegation there several years ago, and the Russians are completely against uh, allowing representatives of civil society to speak because the overwhelming majority of civil society is against the thuggishness and the authoritarianism that the Russians are practicing. So, I mean, I, and, and in, in terms of uh, nitty-gritty on the ground, I mean, I mentioned Mostar, a, a, a city split geographically between Bosniaks and Bosnian Croats, and they, at least the last time I looked, they, they had arrangements in schools where they were segregated, separate but equal. Um, you know, this might sound hopelessly naive, but wouldn't it be nice if, if civil members of civil societies from the Bosniak community and the Bosnian Croat community, you know, probably females, I give them credit for this, um, would, would say, hey, this is wrong. We think our kids ought to go to school together at least part of the day. I mean, there is a concrete example of where a, a vibrant uh, civil society, if, if helped by the powers that be, might actually have, have an influence. It's at least worth trying. And, and there are civil society groups in Bosnia, incidentally. My center at SAIS put on a conference there a few years ago, and there, were, there, there is no shortage of talent. They just have no power whatsoever. Well, I think we've just got the issues going here. Uh, and as we change panels, please uh, join me in, in, in thanking uh, Mike and, and Jim for their thoughts. change the water. <laughs> so, uh, John. Okay. John. Sarah. Okay, well, now we're on to the second panel, and uh, I think this is going to be interesting because we've already started digging into the issues and look forward to hearing what our new panel has to say. As we discussed before, the focus of this panel is looking uh, at the lessons from the Balkans and specifically into what can be done uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we have a great panel. Uh, just quick intros. Uh, John Herbst, 
uh, is the director of the Atlantic Council's Dino Patricio uh, Eurasia Center. Before the Atlantic Council, John served for 31 years in U.S. Foreign Service. He was U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine from 2003 to 2006 and Ambassador to Uzbekistan from 2000 to 2003. Sarah Mendelson uh, is a Distinguished Service Professor of Public Policy and she is head of Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College. Previously, she was U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and U.S. Representative to the United Nations Economic and Social Council. She has spent over two decades working on development and human rights as a scholar and a practitioner. Boris Ruge uh, is Minister and Deputy Chief, Mission, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission in the German Embassy here in Washington. He was previously the German ambassador to Saudi Arabia and the special envoy for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Of particular interest uh, to us today, he was head of the political department in the office of the High Representative and the EU Special Representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina from 2006 to 2008. And he was chief political advisor to two successive commanders of K4 from 2001 to 2002. So with those introductions, let's get right into the, the questions. And I'll start with you, John. Uh, so Jim Pardue has notes that American peacemakers use aggressive diplomacy to give structure, incentives, and momentum to the peace process. When necessary, they authorize the use of NATO military force to end the fighting. Is the model of aggressive diplomacy backed by force an option for peace building uh, in eastern Ukraine? Should the U.S. and the EU be more aggressive in dealing with Ukraine and Russia? What leverage or incentives does the international community have to influence the parties to compromise and negotiate seriously? John. Uh, first, it's important to understand that the problem in Ukraine has a serious, uh, seriously different from the problem in the Balkans because you have um, one of the world's two great nuclear superpowers committing aggression against its neighbors. So the risks of American action are much higher in Ukraine than they are in the Balkans. Everyone in the world seems to understand that. What is not nearly as well understood is that the risk of American inaction is greater in Ukraine than it was in the Balkans. When, one of the, when the world's second largest military power is changing borders by force and running a war against its neighbors, that is a principal threat to global security, global stability, and the prosperity based upon global stability. Now, the short answer to your question is that you need strong American diplomacy to deal with this problem. Uh, I hesitate to use the word aggressive because of the associations of that word. But you need strong American diplomacy because the only force that can stop aggression committed by Moscow is the United States. Now, I'm not advocating here that American troops meet Russian troops in Donbass. And let's not, let's not kid ourselves. There are thousands of regular Russian soldiers, principally officers, right now in Donbass. I am suggesting that while Moscow is the world's second greatest military power, and much stronger than Ukraine in any military standoff, it has significant weaknesses which we can and should exploit. The Obama administration's policy towards Ukraine was exceptionally weak, and I don't think President Obama just did great power politics, and I can get into that if someone wants to talk about that in Q&A. Uh, but the Obama administration had the, the right policy on sanctions. This was not, this was more leadership from behind the principal authors of our sanction policy were Dan Fried and Tory Newland, not President Obama. He essentially said, see what you can do, and they did some very good work, in part because the Chancellor of Germany sometime mid-late summer of 2014 realized she had a problem in the East, which he didn't understand, perhaps at the beginning of that year. And her leadership from that point forward was absolutely essential and remains essential to this day. So strong sanctions are important to bringing Moscow to stop its aggression in Ukraine. The second element of a strong American diplomacy 
was a step that the Obama administration was very reluctant to take, although it took some many steps, and that's to provide serious arms to Ukraine. Uh, the Obama administration, to its credit, did give something called counter-battery radar for missiles to Ukraine, which reduced substantially Ukrainian casualties. But they refrained from providing, quote, unquote, lethal weapons. The Trump administration, despite the very peculiar instincts of the president, has pursued a much better policy towards Russia and towards Ukraine than its predecessor by not just continuing the sanctions policy, although Congress deserves credit for that, the president by himself was heading off in the wrong direction, uh, but then deciding to arm Ukraine. And all of the chicken littles who claim that Russia would, would uh, escalate in Ukraine once we provided lethal weapons have been proved wrong at least over the past seven weeks. Of course, the response from the Kremlin to decision to send Javelin missiles has been very, very mild. A deputy foreign minister said something, and that was it. And the reason why it was mild, because Putin has a loser in Ukraine. And escalation is a bad political step for the Kremlin. Now, having said all that, that doesn't mean that we're going to see uh, a just and fair peace emerge in Ukraine. Uh, we have seen some signs over the past six or eight months of reconsideration in Moscow. Those signs are evident first in the very serious talks that are taking place between Kurt Volker and um, Vyacheslav Sirkov. And the interesting thing about these talks, besides the fact that some interesting conversations are taking place, is that Volker sounds like me. In other words, an unabashed, I won't say hawk, unabashed advocate of strong diplomacy against Kremlin aggression. Yet the Russians treat him as a conduit for possible progress. That's point one. That's the most important point. Point two, we've seen um, uh, Moscow think tankers who want to ma maintain good gra the good graces of the Kremlin floating very interesting ideas. Two articles have appeared over the past two months, one by uh, 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 four, four different authors. Um, Alexander Dinkin, um, Trubnikov, his first name I forget, he's a general or former general. Um, Zagorsky and the fourth name, oh, Alex Alexei Bartov. Uh, which talked about all sorts of interesting peacekeeping ideas, which in fact could lead to a peace in Donbass. The second article is by a guy considered to be always the most interesting foreign policy thinker among the officials in Moscow, official thinkers, and that's Dmitry Trenin, who a month after President Trump won his campaign, his election, was saying Ukraine would have to do whatever Russia wanted, because they were expecting very friendly American policy, which never emerged. But then about five or six weeks ago, he put out a very different piece in which he said inter alia that, well, Russia could actually live with Ukraine and NATO. Who'd have thunk it? Anyway, serious people in Moscow have permission from on high to be floating these ideas because Putin's idea that he could somehow control Ukraine has turned out to be a very bad policy, a very bad move. Now, that's basically an answer to your question, but I'd like to say one more thing. We heard a lot in the last first hour about corruption in Ukraine. What we've heard has been, to be polite, inexact. Corruption in Ukraine is a serious problem, no doubt about it. And it goes to the highest levels of the government, no doubt about it. But it's also true that there has been extraordinary success in fighting corruption in Ukraine. Ground zero for corruption in Ukraine for the last 25 years was a place called Naftakhaz, the official gas company of the Ukrainian government. Reforms were put into place starting three years ago, which made all pricing for gas market pricing, as a result of which a $9 billion Ukrainian perpetual budget deficit became a surplus. And the principal source of ill-gotten gains was removed from the, from the playing field. Second reform, which did away with massive corruption, was something called ProZoro. And actually, USAID uh, had a lot to do with ProZoro. They provided support for this. And ProZoro made all government contracting transparent. Now, there remains serious corruption in Ukraine, especially in the courts, especially in the justice system, and we see resistance at the top. But the corruption in Ukraine has not led to the, uh, the abuse of American assistance, the abuse of international assistance. And by what I find is Ukraine has a serious problem with corruption. And keep in mind, I say this as probably the only person in this room who's drawn the personal ire of a prime minister of Ukraine for slamming him on corruption. So I'm not a softie on this issue. But this issue is overstated and misplayed, in part by people who don't follow us closely enough, and in part, of course, by those who want to do the bidding of a giant neighbor to the north of Kiev. Great. And with that, I'm done.
Okay, thank you, John. Uh, so, Boris, there's been a lot of discussion about U.S. diplomacy, uh, and, and yet uh, Ukraine is in the EU neighborhood. Uh, just wonder if you could talk to us a bit about the role of the uh, EU and uh, and how, uh, what kind of leverage is there? What kind of role does the EU play in bringing peace to Ukraine? Okay. Many thanks, Charles, and thanks for having me today. Um, first, I think um, I agree with with John that it's difficult to overstate the differences between the Western Balkans' strategic uh, context and what we're looking at in Ukraine, because we have Russia there. It is the dominant military power in that part of the world. So there's many options we do not have that existed for NATO um, in the Balkans. Um, if we look at our leverage, um, I would start, I have a number of points. Um, I would say first and foremost, our leverage is the EU and the United States of America working hand in glove. That's key. Um, it's always key. It's particularly important in this case. And then I'd mention um, a number of things, um, and, and I'll make it short. Um, first, denying Russia and uh, the forces backed by it in eastern Ukraine any kind of recognition and hanging in there for the long haul. Right? There's no guarantee that we can change the situation um, in eastern Ukraine and, and uh, in Crimea, but um, I think we have experiences from European history in the 20th century suggesting that um, you can maintain a legal position for a very long period of time um, and you can change realities on the ground. Um, and sometimes you need to think in terms of years and decades and so on. So maintaining, um, maintaining that legal position, um, uh, denying recognition is key. Now, economic leverage is key as well. And, um, and that's something that we have used. Um, it has something that has had an, a major impact on Russia. Um, it has come at a significant price, by the way, something that is sometimes underestimated in Washington, D.C. Um, it is the German economy that pays much higher of a price mm -hmm for maintaining sanctions than the U.S. economy or some of our EU partners. But um, as John pointed out, Chancellor Merkel has been very clear on this, um, and we've been willing to pay that price. Um, so uh, that's, that's important. Um, third point, I think this is, this is extremely um, important, um, making Ukraine strong um, and making Ukraine attractive um, to those who have been pulled into the Russian orbit, if you want to call it that. That's key. So the stronger Ukraine is in terms of democracy, um, of its economy, of a vibrant civil society and all those things, the harder it becomes for people in um, uh, eastern Ukraine and also Crimea in the long term. So, so that's important. Um, I think those are, those are the three key points that, um, that I, would, I would highlight. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, the, we've already heard a lot about corruption uh, in the first panel, and John's made some uh, important points here as well. And, but let me just you know, reflect back on uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, it was uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, uh, who we heard was heavily engaged in, in this uh, part of the world, uh, went uh, further than, than Jim has gone in terms of the issue of corruption uh, to say that uh, re the Ukraine's uh, reforms uh, related to uh, corruption are critical to achieving peace in the Donbass. Uh, do you believe that the reforms uh, uh, and the peace process are uh, that closely linked? Uh, and knowing the state of, of corruption in Ukraine, what concrete measures can be taken to address corruption before or, uh, or as part of a peace process? Thank you, Charles, and thank you to uh, our host at USAP. Um, there are, as John suggested, many, many different angles to discussing both corruption and crimes. Um, I want to start, actually, in the Balkans. Um, my engagement with the Balkans began as a Russia scholar uh, with a grant from the MacArthur Foundation looking at this moment of success between U.S., Russia, and military. It was lauded as um, the high point. As I investigated um, the U.S.-Russian military relationship um, in Bosnia uh, and then later in Kosovo, I discovered a very dark underside, which was that the deployment of both NATO and U.N. troops uh, had stimulated a demand for the trafficking of women and girls into Bosnia and later Kosovo, and that in some cases, while many uniformed service members served honorably, um, U.S. contractors were involved. Um, various parts of 
uh, NATO and UN peacekeeping missions were involved. Um, this led to uh, about 14 years ago uh, exactly the first ever meeting at NATO on this issue, which I had the privilege to co-host along with the U.S. ambassador and the Norwegian ambassador. The Norwegian ambassador did this because he had been the SRSG in Bosnia, and he found this unfinished business. He was mortified by what had happened when he was the uh, UN Secretary General's special representative in Bosnia, uh, and was determined to address this. Uh, if you want to read more about it, I suggest my barracks and brothels, which you can find online. Um, there is a great report uh, that Human Rights Watch produced in 2002 called Hopes Betrayed, um, which details a lot of this, and there's the movie The Whistleblower. All to say that we, and we're going to talk a little bit more about lessons learned, best practices. We know that this is an ongoing problem. We don't want to have the international involvement be a stimulus for corruption. Now, going to Ukraine and going to the people of Ukraine, let's not forget that Euromaidan was about ultimately a popular movement against corruption. Um, and this is what absolutely drove, I think, Mr. Putin and the Kremlin mad. The, the, the scene of peaceful Ukrainian citizens walking uh, on the estate of Yanukovych and finding all that they found. Um, I mean, for me, I think of that moment for Mr. Putin as the similar moment when the wall comes down and he's trying to call Moscow to get a response and there's silence. This is a definitive moment uh, for how Putin thinks about the entire involvement. Um, to the point that Ukraine has made progress, there's something called the Open Government Partnership. It is a voluntary um, movement. It involves governments and civil society. They're equal at the table. Ukraine joined in 2012. OGP started in 2011. I encourage you to go online and learn more about Ukraine's promise, its commitments, particularly the 2016 to 2018 plan. It's multifaceted. It, it addresses procurement, uh, open budgets, um, a variety of transparency and accountability mechanisms. Uh, it's complex. It's difficult to implement. It's an ongoing project. But it gives you a sense of the, the multi-stakeholder um, effort inside Ukraine. So far be it for me to criticize Vice President Biden. Um, I think that it's obviously a, an important part of it. But understanding what else is going on in terms of inside Ukraine on the corruption piece is important. Now, finally, to go to Russia. Um, this is the real vulnerability for the Kremlin. This is why Mr. Navalny is under such heat. Um, it's also why he gets upwards of 30 million viewers looking at his YouTube. Uh, the issue of corruption is something that motivates populations, oftentimes more than all sorts of other crimes, including torture or disappearance. It's what led to the fall of Pinochet. Um, so I think that to the extent that there is a kind of um, global movement on transparency and accountability, a global movement pressing towards open and a countervailing um, effort towards closed, uh, I'm going to bet on the side of open. And I think that also our everything that you're holding in your pocket with the iPhone and transparency and accountability that's provided by technology is helping to fuel this. Uh, so ultimately, we can talk more about the details of what a peace process looks like, what a, what a peacekeeping operation would look like. Um, it's, at, we have to be at the forefront in understanding the role of corruption, um, but I don't think it's the biggest obstacle. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, John, talking about uh, details. Uh, so Jim has spoken about the need for specific measurable commitments. Uh, for Bosnia, Macedonia, and Kosovo, this meant very detailed and lengthy uh, documents. I think Bosnia, I think Jim said, was three binder, large binders. Uh, Macedonia, 15 pages. Kosovo, 60 pages. While in Eastern Slavonia, the UN uh, got by with a basic agreement with 14 points. So what is needed for peace in Ukraine? Uh, how do you balance the need for measurable commitments uh, with the need for flexibility to manage a complex process? In a sense, all you need for peace in Donbass is for Putin to withdraw his troops and stop the aggression. 
Uh, of course, it's not as simple as that. Uh, but you will, you will have the dawn of a real peace when he conceives in his mind that he cannot achieve his objectives and he has to get out. Uh, you have this negotiating process in train. Um, and I, in fact, I, I, I neglected to mention when I talked about the Circo Volker channel that you still have the Minsk negotiations, which are important because the Minsk framework remains the framework of these talks. Uh, but in, in these, in the Circo Volker talks, ideas are being put forward on key issues which could be the cover behind which Moscow gives up its imperial aim in eastern Ukraine. For this to happen, though, you need to maintain uh, the pressure from the West. Boris is right that U.S.-EU cooperation is essential. The sanctions, um, I mean, I would love to see sanctions increase, and I have all sorts of ideas to do that, but just maintaining them is probably enough. I'd like to see more American and Western military equipment going to Ukraine. I'll bet we will see that, albeit it should be done quietly. The Russians will pick it up via their intelligence anyway, and you don't need to rub their faces in it. But these, these are the things that you need. Uh, a peacekeeping force in connection with international control of the border, which would stop the Russian ability to send in troops, to send in arms, uh, for that matter, to send in money, um, could be an important face saver, which would enable Moscow to, to climb down from this tree. Th that's how I see it. Uh, but again, all of these negotiations are simply theater in which we find out the intentions of the Russian leadership. Okay. Oh, excuse me, one more important point, and I shouldn't minimize this. The, Ukraine will have to do some important things relating to uh, decentralization to permit elections, and including special elections in the occupied territories. And I, I remain convinced that this will happen at the end of the day, but the political process in Ukraine is dysfunctional on this issue because everybody is so concerned about getting an edge on their political opponent as opposed to doing the national interest requirements of the Ukrainian people. But here, Western, uh, strong Western diplomacy, including, well, actually, I'm on the record, I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> strong Western diplomacy could be helpful as well. Right. Uh, so, Boris, uh, your observations on the balance between flexibility uh, and uh, very specific uh, commitments, but also from the EU perspective, you know, we have a large and complex agreement uh, enforcing that, uh, particularly from an EU perspective with its broad membership. Uh, what are the challenges you see there? Seems to me, um, and Ambassador Pardue can disagree, obviously, um, the analogy, um, the closest analogy we have from the Balkans is Eastern Slavonia mm -hmm. and possibly Macedonia. Not so much Kosovo, not so much uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, because obviously no one's proposing to put um, Ukraine as a whole under some kind of international uh, transitional authority. Um, uh, as a starting point. Now we do have, we do have an agreement um, and that's the Minsk Agreement. Um, now people complain um, and rightly that it has not been implemented, but it says all the things that are important actually. It talks about full restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty, of control of the borders, and it talks, that's the other side of the coin, um, about local autonomy and, um, and these kinds of things, amnesty. Um, so we have a starting point. The fact that it hasn't been implemented doesn't speak against um, uh, the agreement per se. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, uh, the French and German view, um, uh, France and Germany being the participants, Western participants, if you like, in the Normandy format, um, um, our view has been that we should, we should stick with this. The new element that, that comes into the picture here is precisely the notion of a UN peacekeeping operation, which interestingly was, was put on the table by the Russians, remarkable. Um, it was put forward in such a way as to um, raise a number of concerns, legitimate, I think, which we share with the government of Ukraine. Um, but all of us, I think, have decided, the US government, the Europeans, and the government of Ukraine, that we should try and work this um, to develop a UN peacekeeping operation that would allow for Minsk to be implemented. And of course, this is where we work very closely with Kurt Volker and uh, Open Brackets. We're delighted that it's him. Uh, who's taken on this job for the U.S. government. Um, so, so that's something that um, uh, we, have, we have a building block, which is Minsk, 
Um, we are in the midst of a discussion about how the UN could be brought into the picture to help implementation of Minsk, but a tied, a tied to a number of very clear conditions on which we agree with, with Ukraine. Okay. So let me stay with you, Boris, uh, and go beyond the agreement to actually implementation. Uh, as Jim is uh, very colorfully described, uh, the implementation is the difficult, often grinding side of peacemaking. I think he also called it unsexy. Uh, as a USAID officer, I think it's very sexy, but that's another matter. We can talk about that later. Uh, but he, he did say that, you know, in most cases, it uh, is far more, the implementation is far more difficult and always takes much more time than the negotiation itself. What are, will be the critical challenges in implementing an agreement in Ukraine? What capabilities would an international peacekeeping uh, and an international uh, interim administration require? So a number of things. I, um, as you mentioned, I, I have some experience in, in Kosovo working for NATO, um, um, and I have some experience from Bosnia. Um, and of course, there was a lessons learned between Bosnia and, and Kosovo. I think um, our approach in Kosovo from 1999 onwards was an improvement. Uh, what you need is you need a, um, a very, um, very good structure for coordination. You need a person who runs that structure. You need to bring all the key uh, stakeholders to the table. Um, and that's, as we all know, um, anyone who has ever um, been involved in these things knows that this is really hard work. Uh, you're talking about several international organizations. If, in fact, in Ukraine there could be agreement about a UN peacekeeping operation, you would have the OSCE, you would have the UN, you would have the EU working on the economic um, side of this, you would have several governments being part of this, the US government, of course, um, Russia as well, on the other hand. Um, major European governments, and bringing those people to the table and getting them to pull in the same direction is really, really hard. Mm. And much of the time it doesn't work, and we had a period and in Bosnia worked, worked very well with Paddy Ashdown, um, but, um, but it's, it's difficult. So, so you need clarity in terms of the uh, coordinating structures on the ground. You need a good mechanism, and I think Ambassador Pardue describes that as well in terms of what we had back in the Balkans in terms of a contact group. Um, those kinds of things. You meet and make things work at the UN Security Council, it's difficult. Um, just to end on this, obviously if you did have a UN peacekeeping operation to implement Minsk, it would need to be a robust operation. That's pretty clear from, from a German point of view. I think there's agreement with the US and France and Ukraine on this. So you would be, um, you'd have to have an ability to enforce the agreement on the ground. Um, and that's an interesting proposition, obviously. But if the government of Russia um, w changed its calculus, and that is, of course, what we're, what we're talking about, um, if they came to uh, recognize that their policy so far has done nothing but uh, push Ukraine away from Russia, um, unify large parts of the population of Ukraine um, in a uh, sort of pro-European direction, um, and if Russia were to come to the conclusion that what it is doing here is very costly and unproductive, then you know, there's a chance that, that Moscow might change its calculus and opt for a more constructive approach, which I think would allow us to deal with all those problems in eastern Ukraine. Crimea is perhaps more, more difficult. Okay, great. Sarah, your thoughts? So let's uh, follow the lead of Václav Havel and think as if this were possible, uh, as, as if this were going to happen. Um, I think the first thing is the Secretary General needs to be invested in this. Um, when a new peacekeeping mission is stood up, having the Secretary General understand it as part of his or her mission is important. Um, following on the last Secretary General's lead, there's been a lot of thinking about how to do humanitarian assistance in a different way. Um, the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016 um, followed a report that came out of the UN OCHA, um, the office that coordinates humanitarian assistance called One Humanity Shared Responsibility. And it's, it's relevant for peacekeeping in that it is really putting a premium on the role that local organizations, local populations play. Um, rather than having 
uh, supply side from New York or other based agencies, you're really putting a premium on what are the needs on the ground. Um, number one, you'd have to have also a very strong, robust SRSG uh, who implemented a policy of zero tolerance on a range of issues, not just said that there was a policy of zero tolerance on, for example, corruption. Um, and that will mean expelling people. It might mean uh, arresting people. Um, you'd need to have probably a troop commitment of somewhere between 30 and 40,000, so it's not too soon to think about what countries might um, provide those troops. It's probably no NATO countries. Um, it's a question of who exactly would be there. Um, and I think that th there's one final issue that was touched on. There are a variety of, of uh, details that need to be worked out, but you know we have a lot of experience with this, and I think that both in terms of the peacekeeping operation, the mandate, the sequencing, and for the international interim uh, administration, we can figure this out. There is a very thorny issue of transitional justice, historical memory. We touched on it in the last panel. I think we're a long way from actually knowing how to do this well. Um, we're actually pretty good at elections and, and running in and being able to set that up, both U.S. organizations, the U.N. more generally, but on this issue of how countries uh, reconcile with violent episodes of their past or with their neighbors is still a very much um, an ongoing exercise. And the latest research suggests that rather than having it be international tribunals, that local demand for transitional justice is stronger. So let's take a, a shift to a different question, Sarah. Uh, we've already had some uh, comments uh, in the first panel and, and by you just now in, in terms of the role of civil society and so forth. But if we, when we look back at the Balkans peace process, what are the lessons we should draw uh, uh, from that period and even more from what we have learned as best practices since then uh, for how to have an inclusive peace process? Uh, what concrete actions can we take to make the peace process and the peacekeeping mission uh, uh, that might occur in Ukraine uh, a more inclusive uh, process? You know, there's, in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of research on um, the role of having an inclusive process, which includes, for example, women in the discussion, and the ability for the peacekeeping agreement to stick. Um, the evidence is pretty solid uh, that if you don't, the, the majority of um, peacekeeping agreements uh, or peace operations uh, fail. So I think it's important. There's going to have to be demand signals from different parts of the international system that those who are engaged in negotiations include women. Um, the peacekeeping operation should include, best practices suggest, at least 30 percent um, women troops. Um, I think that I understand the, the point about negotiations being difficult, uh, having spent 15 months at the UN on a range of issues, um, and that having civil society at the table may complicate things. But again, this issue of having some ability to make sure that local, uh, a variety of issues, whether it is um, the violence that's been experienced or it's the delivery of pensions, or making sure that things aren't missed that there is a role, uh, an ability to understand at some point in the process, um, you know, there's a lot of psychosocial uh, needs that, that should be addressed and oftentimes are overlooked. There's a lot of trauma that's gone on. Uh, and I, again, I don't think that we're always um, well set up to do it. We have certain things that we do well mm -hmm. and certain things that are actually extremely important in the normalization, if you will of a society uh, that has experienced what is going on in, in eastern Ukraine. Um, and it's not necessarily that the, the U.S. or the Europeans or the U.N. aren't capable of doing it. It just it means that you've got to have, you've got to go the extra mile uh, or kilometer and think through what that means. John, can you give you a uh, follow-up on that? Uh, how do you see uh, the getting civil society involved? How do you see getting uh, the needs of people reflected in negotiations as well as in implementation uh, and even in the peacekeeping process? I think that these are secondary issues to the principal issue 
of getting Russia to withdraw from Donbass. And I think the best way to get Russia to withdraw from Donbass is by using those measures that we've already discussed. But it is true that Ukraine is a emerging democratic and open society. And that Ukraine will need to do certain things uh, within the Minsk process, within the context of the volcker Surkov negotiations, which require political will. So it's important to in engage civil society in this conversation so that the RADA, will, which needs to pass legislation, will pass legislation necessary to meet the Ukrainian side of, of, this, uh, of these commitments. I, I would add that the issue of corruption, which is related but distinct from the problem of Russian aggression in Donbass, requires a heavy civil society role. And in fact, um, the position I've taken consistently for the past four years, given the questionable instincts of the top leadership in Ukraine regarding corruption, is that you only get real reform in Ukraine by a combination of civil society, the United States, the EU, and the international financial institutions. And if you look carefully at the process of reform in Ukraine, you'll see that's, that's been actually a pretty good guide. Hmm. Oh, and last point, I don't want to give short shrift to this. While again, the big question is changing Putin's mind and getting his boys out of Donbass, there are serious humanitarian issues created by Kremlin aggression and they are in the process of being addressed, although Ukraine has limited resources. And the international community needs to be mindful of these problems and prepared to step up when you have the peace to provide that assistance to deal with the 1.7 IDPs, the eight or so hundred thousand refugees, and the terrible damage done by Kremlin aggression to infrastructure and business in eastern Ukraine. And on that score, we're going to have an event at the Atlantic Council on March 20, talking all about that. <laughs> Great. Well, good. Uh, so on that topic, if you will, uh, Boris, you know, when we talk, look beyond having an agreement, uh, first you've got to get the agreement, then you have to implement it. But then there's the question of sustaining uh, the peace. Uh, and, you know, Jim has noted that limited economic investment continues to exacerbate ethnic tensions in the Balkans. Uh, the econo economy of eastern Ukraine has, was already in serious decline before the war uh, and has declined significantly since. What needs to be done? What are the priorities to revitalize that economy and create good paying jobs to sustain, to sustain the peace uh, in eastern Ukraine? And can Ukraine count on EU investment to provide the resources needed? Obviously, we hope that it can count on U.S. investments as well, <laughs> um, just fine. But the, the key thing, several key points. Number one, it's not just about eastern Ukraine. Um, John would know what is the, the percentage of territory that is, is, is occupied, maybe below 10 percent, I would so imagine, of Ukraine. If you're talking about in Donbass, it's exactly. 3 or 4 percent. Yeah. So um, what uh, the, the key, obviously, is, is to make you, the Ukrainian economy strong, to make it a vibrant economy. Um, and then, of course, there's a separate issue, which is reconstruction, rebuilding. Um, again, John would know uh, more about this than I do, um, whether it's possible to, to um, uh, bring back the heavy industry in Donbass. I don't know. It's probably difficult. There's a lot of damage. Um, I don't know whether it was competitive. Um, before the conflict, I imagine uh, it might not have been. Um, the framework for this from an EU point of view was the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement, uh, which, as we remember, was a key part of Russian unhappiness, right? Um, and it has been in provisional force for several years now, but in September of last year, it came um, into full force. Um, so we now have a framework between the EU and the Ukraine, and it applies to um, um, issues such as the famous DCFTA, Deep and Comprehensive Free Tra Trade Agreement, but it, it applies to foreign policy coordination in many, many other areas. We had visa liberalization last year with Ukraine. Very, very important, as you can imagine, for Ukrainians to be able to travel to the EU without having, having to get a visa beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's important as part of the framework. Um, uh, government um, funding and um, what the international financial institutions can provide will be very important, no doubt. Um, but at the end of the day, 
a success or failure will depend on Ukraine's ability to create conditions that attract international capital because it feels that it's, it's worthwhile investing in Ukraine. You know, so we can help on, as governments, as international organizations, uh, we can help um, uh, in that regard on the edges, but it's the private sector at the end of the day um, in, in the 21st century that's going to make the difference. And so that will be key, and that is where we get back to issues such as corruption, good governance, um, and, and all these things. I think that's, that's what I would, I would contribute. Great. Thank you, Boris. Uh, so, Sarah, uh, Jim also noted the issues of disinformation in mm -hmm. the Balkans, uh, Russian disinformation, and I uh, wonder if you could speak to how is that a challenge for Ukraine in a sustaining the peace and any other observations you may have mm -hmm. on that, on sustaining the peace? Sure. Um, first to say I agree, obviously, that Putin's decision is fundamental, but I think it's important to go beyond that and think what are the, the other elements that need to, to happen. Um, this weaponization of information is really critical. Um, we're experiencing this in multiple fronts. We should assume that it will continue in Ukraine uh, well after a peace uh, negotiation is done and a peacekeeping operation is fielded. And I am not confident that uh, just as we are struggling in the United States to understand how we respond, and I think our European colleagues, to the use of social media to divide grievances that already exist uh, by uh, Russian sources, I think that we should assume that's going to happen in Ukraine and in parts of eastern Ukraine. And I don't think the UN is well positioned to address it. And so we should be thinking about what that looks like. Um, what kinds of technical expertise are needed to bring to bear. Um, I say this thinking of my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon who are quite focused on these issues. Um, who around the world could be thinking about how you would monitor? It, there are many different contexts in which we see this happening. Um, it has become a standard effort in preventing atrocities, for example. Um, it needs to be a standard issue in peacekeeping operations. Um, on this issue now, so those are two slightly negative points. Let me end on a positive point. Not to be Pollyanna-ish, but I think there is an opportunity um, for regrowth. And again, thinking of, of Pittsburgh, but other, other cities that have become essentially, they've moved from the 19th century to the 21st century. Uh, I think there needs to be a lot of thought into what kinds of industry would actually make sense? What kind of workforce would you need to be able to support it? What kind of investment would it draw? Uh, I think those who think going back to coal in eastern Ukraine is, it, I just, I don't see a future there. Um, so what else would it be uh, for the, the, the fundamentals for that economy? Okay, so now we open up to questions, but I'm gonna uh, give Jim Pardue the first uh, opportunity to ask a question and then we'll open up to everybody else. Jim, uh, I think we have a microphone up front, please. Thank you. Um, one of the keys to uh, success in the Balkans was the fact that the, the President and the Secretary of State were totally focused on, on the issue. Jim, can you speak up a little bit? Yeah. I'm not sure the microphone's Is that Okay, let me get a little closer. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> okay, one of the one of the keys to success in the in the Balkans was the fact the president and secretary of state were totally involved in this uh, on a daily basis, and we had very close relationships with our key European allies. I just my question is whether uh, major progress is possible in the Ukraine in in Ukraine. I've been counseled. It's Ukraine, not <laughs> the Ukraine. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, in Ukraine uh, with the current set of relationships with traditional allies in Europe and a distracted White House and the confusion in the administration over the U.S. relationship with Russia. Who wants to take it? Sarah, you want to take that? Um, I hear you, and it is a concern. I think one of the sort of parlor games people play in Washington is trying to figure out what impact the retreat of U.S. leadership has when it matters and when it doesn't matter. And I think if there's enough momentum, especially from European colleagues but others as well, along with a very good process that 
Kurt and others are, are leading, um, that it is possible. I don't know that it's, it's absolutely, I, I understand the role that the Secretary uh, and POTUS played um, in, in previous administrations. I still believe there's something that can be done uh, even if it is not a daily agenda for, for this president. Uh, it, it really involves the will of some other parties that we've been discussing. John, any thoughts on this? Okay, let's go to, so we're one back there. We've got a lot of hands, so we have to. So keep them short thank so we you. can pack uh, them John, in. Uh, John Katz, uh, German Marshall Fund. Uh, thank you for this event. I have a couple quick is questions. That, is that on? Is this on? It is. Okay. okay. Uh, one actually has to do, uh, it's to Boris, is a question about, about the EU track and lessons learned in the, in the Balkans based on the fact that the Balkans have been on track for over f many Balkan countries for 15 plus years and that, that, that stall process has had an impact on the, uh, the trajectory of Balkan countries and Macedonia is one of those real test cases where they were very close to being uh, in or on that track and then that track stopped. Obviously, Ukraine and Georgia, Moldova have their own association agreements, DCFTA. They all are interested in EU membership, but the perspective isn't there. Um, maybe you could speak to that and you know lessons learned from that. Um, although it's still, you know, it's still a lesson undergo, you know, that's still ongoing. Um, if you can speak to that, and then uh, John, I wanted to ask about uh, sphere of influence. There's been a couple pieces written here in Washington I've seen about the war, about neutrality, uh, about Ukraine and maybe others, that part of this deal with uh, Minsk and going beyond with Russia includes some, some terminology of neutrality, that these countries like Ukraine should not become NATO members, that we ought to respect that. I don't agree with that opinion, so I just want to say that up front, but it's something that I think there's something else within the context of U.S.-Russian relations in Ukraine that, that is also <laughs> out there in this conversation and want to understand where that fits in. And then also, Sierra, I agree with the, uh, you know, I think really one of the things that's, I thought, missing from Minsk this process the entire time was the, was the economic component of this, um, a challenging one. And maybe uh, speak to that a little bit more, and, and Boris, maybe you want to. I heard what you said about, and I think this goes to the U.S. and others, who's going to help work with Ukraine to pay for this? Um, because the, we know the price tag is going to be quite significant, and if you don't address that, if there isn't that type of stability on the ground, then it's very likely to fail this process. You could find yourself in a worse position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, Ukrainians, internally than we are today. Great. Thank you. So a lot of questions, in, in fact, in there. Uh, Boris, you want to lead off? Yeah. Um, I think we just had the European Commission put out a strategy on the Western Balkans whenever it was 10 days ago. Um, and it reaffirms the vision of um, the countries of the Western Balkans joining the European Union. Um, that's important. I think if, um, if you don't have that, you're looking at, um, at reform fatigue, at failure um, in individual countries, certainly. The difficulty, of course, is that um, the EU is already quite big. Um, and getting to decisions is, is already difficult. So um, I think there's legitimate questions being asked by uh, governments and by citizens within the EU, how can we make it work? You know, there's an imperative to bring these countries in, but how will we make the EU, how will we keep it functional? Um, so there's, there's really a you know, piece of homework here, which is how can we reform our institutions and maintain a, um, a capability to act? Um, but, but no doubt, I think this is, this is a key part, and for Ukraine, it's a key part, and that's what people in Ukraine fought over, right? Um, starting in, not 2013, but actually if we go back to 20, 2004, if I remember correctly. Um, obviously, you're right, in, in uh, the areas of, of eastern Ukraine, um, there is a lot of investment that is necessary, and I imagine that that's the kind of place where you will have to mobilize international funding, governmental funding, funding from, from international financial institutions um, in order to make that work. There's no doubt about that. It's not just a market-driven thing. I agree. John, is there any quick follow-ups on the other questions? Um, on the issue of neutrality, this is something which has been part of the conversation since the Russians went into Donbass. You had a famous, you had famous op-eds by both Brzezinski and Kissinger along these lines. Um, I don't know of anyone in Ukraine uh, 
outside the opposition bloc to be willing to talk about this. I think it's a complete non-starter in Ukraine. And I also think that uh, the, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the U.S. government. I left the State Department seven and a half years ago. But I'm pretty sure there's not part of the U.S. policy and not going to be part in any near future. Sarah? Uh, very briefly, on Minsk, I think one of the things that I've heard repeatedly is that while, uh, with all due respect to our European colleagues, that Minsk is not terribly supported by large parts of the Ukrainian population. And to go beyond Minsk, you know, recognize Minsk, but go beyond it uh, in the Donbass's future, um, this economic piece needs to be a part of it. And, you know, maybe it is a study that the World Bank does uh, or the IFIs do. I think it needs to be informed, though, by sustainable development. And by that, I mean um, there will be an uptick in jobs as the international community comes into eastern Ukraine. That will produce a number of jobs, but that is not a sustainable uh, operation. And, you know, we see this in the Balkans. We see this in Bosnia with a lot of unemployed males sitting in coffee shops with a lot of time on their hands. Um, and so trying to figure out what exactly the job growth plan, this is not easy, by the way. We have this uh, in large swaths of the United States. Um, but in this particular context, I think it is really a tremendous challenge to keeping the peace. Let me take three questions. One far back, and then over here, and over here, okay? And then we'll get on to some others. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Ann Phillips, USIP. I have a question about power sharing and structuring the peace. Uh, to bring back the discussion on the Balkans to possible solutions in the Ukraine. The Dayton Accords and the Arhut Agreement provided peace for a long time, but I think we see a lot of the roots of current tensions in the way power sharing was structured along ethnic and religious lines. You've mentioned the possibility of decentralization in Ukraine. How would that work? challenge is always to knit these societies back together again. Comes back to the civil society thing. When I was in, in the Balkans some years ago, women's organizations operated across these ethnic and religious lines. Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks together, and they were just waiting, may I say, for the men to get out of the way so they could bring these societies back together again. And so your thoughts would be welcome. Thank you. Great. And over here, yes. Thank you for the panel, Lydia Zubitska, Wilson Center. Um, I have a question that kind of reiterates the point, uh, point made by Ambassador Herbs about, you know, it's hard to move on unless we start with Russian aggression subsiding or pulling out, and Bora's point of um, emphasizing the importance of peacekeeping as a new element that's emerging on the international calculus there. But be going beyond, um, linking these two and beyond the punitive measures of sanctions and um, you know strong diplomacy what what other attractive pieces could be put on a table to keep Russia involved um, and interested in pursuing that thank you okay. that piece. Great. we have one over here hi um, is this on yeah yeah, um, my name is Gerard Tolan. I'm a professor. I have written books on uh, Bosnia and on uh, Ukraine. Um, coming out of the, the Balkans, um, the peacemaking process in Bosnia was based on an ethno-territorial agreement, the 4951 Dayton Peace Accord, which created uh, Bosnia uh, as a state with two entities. Uh, it was uh, then in Kosovo, it, uh, we established peace because borders were changed and that was recognized, a new state was created. And then in Macedonia, you had a consociational agreement. So three different strategies coming out of the Balkans. You go to, you go to uh, Ukraine uh, today and the best social science research that we have, it's Zias from Berlin, that are doing surveys there in uh, Crimea and also in uh, the Donbass. They indicate the majority of the population in Crimea, and we know this, I know this from my own research as well, um, identify with Russia, are happy with the annexation. The, the indications are in the Donbass, about four million people, 
um, that there's greater identification with Russia. War changes people. War polarizes people. Uh, so why aren't some of the things that brought peace, ugly peace in many ways, peace that's flawed in lots of ways, but nevertheless brought peace in the Balkans, why aren't those on the table in the case of Ukraine? Okay. Um, so, uh, first up, the question of does it do agreement solidify uh, you know, the ethnic lines and, uh, and the role of it, uh, decentralization in, in Ukraine? Uh, who would like to take a stab at that? Boris, please. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, to, to address the last question, I'm not quite sure where you would fit in the Minsk agreement and the elements in there, uh, local autonomy, amnesty, in your typology. Because something, you know, obviously there's something here. Um, that is the quid pro quo, if you like. Restoration of Ukrainian sovereignty, full control over the borders by the government of Ukraine, and in return, local autonomy, amnesty for people who were involved in the insurgency, or whatever you want to call it, against the, against the government in Kiev. I don't know where that, where that fits in precisely. Um, um, change of borders um, you know, is, is not, I think the Kosovo case is, is very particular. I don't think that is something that, that um, anyone in the case of Ukraine would be willing to look at. And an ethno-territorial, it's less of an ethno-territorial issue than, than was, was the case in Bosnia. Um, and again, I think you have to simply have to look at the map and look at what territories we're talking about. Leaving aside Crimea for, for a moment, which is a very difficult question and, and not a short-term short proposition um, in terms of a solution. If you look at, at Donbas, I think you're talking about quite a small part of, of the territory of the state of Ukraine. Um, I think the, the question about what is it that, that we have to offer Russia um, in this, um, it's a good question. That Russia has made it very difficult um, for all of us. The German, you know, German approach to Russia um, and to the Soviet Union, if we go farther back, has always been um, a mix between um, a deterrence and defense peace on the one hand, which is very relevant today, sadly, um, um, and on the other hand, a dialogue peace. And we feel very strongly that we need to, um, we need to uh, maintain channels of communication with Russia. Um, and it's very good to see that the U.S. government has decided to put Kurt Volker out there to, um, to engage with Mr. Surkov, right? Um, and then you can have a conversation about how productive is it, why is it taking so long, all these things. Um, but there is an ongoing communication there, and that's, that's how it needs to be, in our opinion. Um, if you want to move this forward, you have to engage Russia. Um, um, what, what we have to offer, um, I'm a bit, you know, I think you do have to acknowledge, um, uh, you know, concerns by Russian-speaking population in Ukraine, for example, those kinds of things for sure. But I don't know whether we have a, you know, something major that we can put forward um, to get Russia to do what it hasn't done, which is um, make sure that, that uh, the Minsk Agreement is implemented. And if Russia wanted Minsk Agreement to be implemented, um, it would not be so difficult. I think we all agree on that. Okay, we have two minutes, so Sarah, quickly, and um, Mike said he'd like to have a couple words on this one, so. I think the big bargaining chip is uh, to end what has been the isolation of Russia, given this behavior. I mean, understanding that the road to a normal or begin to normalize relationships is through Ukraine. Um, there's a joke that Condi Rice would tell, apparently, that Gorbachev walks in the first day of his uh, chairmanship and says, who are my friends? Uh, Paris, London, Washington. And they're like, no, no, it's Havana. Uh, you've got Syria. And he's like, with friends like that, what can I do? Um, so Putin's not Gorbachev, obviously, but I think that the isolation uh, has had an impact. Mike, quickly, and then yeah. I'm going to give John the last word. Well, Gerard, I, well, right? he's going to probably say yeah, some things I'd I would be say. Very, very careful about citing public opinion data in, in territories that have undergone violence. I mean, the fact is, the last public opinion survey taken in Ukraine before the, in, uh, the invasion showed a, a, a small majority uh, in favor of sticking with Ukraine. 
of in Crimea and Donbass. I was just about to say, yeah, yeah. and the same thing in Donbass. It's even more outspokenly true in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mr. Dodik would like the Republic of Serbska to have a plebiscite there, which would be overwhelmingly for secession. Why? Because of genocide and ethnic cleansing. Before the war started, as you well know, 41% of what's now the territory of the Republic of Serbska was Bosniak, and only 37, 38% Serb and the rest Croat and a few others. The only reason that he'd get a majority is because of killing people. We can't allow that. John, last word. Well, Michael preempted part of what I wanted to say. But let, let me just put this in a different context. You have a crisis in Crimea and in Donbass because a major nation committed aggression against another, not because of lo local dissatisfaction. The Kremlin had to send in its troops to stop Ukraine from taking back all of Donbass in August of 14 because the local population was not going to fight against their government in Kiev, even though they weren't particularly fond of the government in Kiev. That, that is the basic structure of this conflict. And the solution is very simple. Kremlin aggression ceases. Now, getting there does require uh, providing Putin some face savers. And we talked about the process with international peacekeepers and such. But also, there are legitimate steps that the Ukrainian government can take, not inconsistent with the way they behaved in the past, on issues like use of Russian language, on issues like the prerogatives of the Moscow Patriarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church, which can be seen as gestures to the Kremlin, which Putin can point to as his troops leave Ukraine. That's the basic framework in which we'll get a deal. Uh, but this crisis did not start because the, the Ukrainian, ethnic Ukrainians in the villages of Donbass did not get along with the ethnic Russians in the city of Donbass. This began with an insurgency finance led and armed from Moscow. Full stop. John, Sarah, Boris, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, again, thanks to Mike and to Jim for the earlier panel. Please join me in, in thanking them.